If you're comfortable to stand, that's fine. If you're comfortable to kneel, that's fine. And if you would rather just sit down, that's fine. So do what you need to do. But let me ask you to do this. Um, some of you today, you just need somebody to come up and put their hand on your shoulder and pray for you. Maybe you don't have to go into detail what you're praying about, just to know that there's something burdening your heart. You may be praying for someone else or for yourself. But would you just slip your hand up and, and, uh, and we'll send a person over to just stand with you and put their hand on you. That would be very meaningful, I think, if we could do that. So if you all just look around, if you're, even if you're not down front here, you can do that. So uh, anyone needs somebody to just stand with them, put their hands on them, pray for them. Okay, let's pray together. Father, we want to give this time right now to you. We know that we can only come into your presence in a moment like this because the blood of Jesus Christ has made a way that we may come boldly before the throne of grace and find help in our time of need. And Father, for this day and maybe this season of life, this is a great hour of need for people. I know there are those gathered around this altar this morning, Lord, who are calling upon you, who call upon you constantly for a situation in their life, maybe a person in their life that they love dearly, who is hurting. Maybe it's a child or a spouse or a parent, a friend. And Lord, we know that as we pray, we are praying through our high priest, who is Jesus Christ, who knows each of us by name, who knows our sorrows, who knows our tears, who knows our heartaches and our burdens, and who carried them for us and carries them for us. Your word tells us that we are to cast all of our cares upon you because you care for us. And this morning, Father, that is what we are trying to do. We, we want to release these loads that we're carrying. Maybe we have just issues that we've never worked through in our life. Maybe we're bitter at parents that hurt us people who have let us down. Maybe there's anger and brokenness in our homes, our marriages, our parenting, our families, our kids. Some I know are just overloaded, Lord, with care for those in their lives that they are trying to give care to. And the weight of that is enormous. Father, you know the places in our hearts where we're broken, and all of us are broken. All of us are broken. Please help us not to become bitter over others' brokenness and how it sometimes hurts us. Father, I know that there are those today concerned. I know the economy in our nation is still uncertain and, and not on great footing. And I know that some are struggling with jobs and their well-being and, and, and just really their future. And they need your wisdom and your clarity. And Lord, we would pray for ourselves as a church family today because we are also in a time of uncertainty and transition and change is happening. 
And I pray, Father, you will just stabilize us and steer us and continue to help us to walk towards you, Lord. Thank you for those who are here today, faithfully interceding, maybe for another person who is not here. We pray, Father, for those whose hearts are on a lost person today who are just begging you, Father, to lead them to salvation. We know, Lord, you hear everything we prayed today. We know that you hear it. We know that you understand us. We know that there's nothing that you do not understand about us, and we're grateful that we are that well-known, that well-loved, that well-cared for. And I pray you will touch our hearts today, Father. Give direction to us as a church family. Give direction to us, I pray, as a nation, that we may walk through and, and get through these cloudy and divisive days that we're in. May you give us grace. Give us clarity as a church in the ministry that you have entrusted to us here. And may you be glorified in your people this day. And Father, as we go through the remainder of the week to come, we lay all this before you. Much more that's not spoken out loud that only you hear, Father, through the Spirit's groaning in our hearts and his utterance. The things that we can't even say, you know. You know. And we are thankful for that. For it is in Jesus' name that we pray. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Now, as you stand and help each other stand back up again, that would be great. Um, Well, I'm very surprised and pleased to see people here this morning after last night. I know some of you had a very, very late night and uh, surprise in what has happened. And, and I'm glad we had that to celebrate. I need to take a moment uh, before we get going to uh, thank you. Uh, last week, uh, humbled, it humbled me. Thank you for the kind things that were said. Many of you have spoken to me privately and sent me cards. And I, I can't believe I've been here 30 years. I can't believe I've been anywhere 30 years, but I can't believe that it's at this point. And this is what I had prayed. Lord, just give me 30 years. So I'm now looking at every day I get extra beyond that as a bonus, and uh, I'm grateful to be here on a bonus day. So I'm, uh, I'm thankful, but I'm thankful for the way, uh, the way you have loved me and cared for me. Thank you. I cannot imagine a way that that day could have been better unless my wife was with me. And you, uh, you even helped that happen in some ways. So thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, we are... Uh, uh, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. I... Uh, um, I promise you, and I, I want to keep my promise uh, every year that you get three stewardship sermons in January. Um, and uh, we'll, get, we'll get two of those. You'll get one of them in February. So we'll, we'll have three in a row if you make budget. If you don't, all bets are off. <laughs> and, and we could be in this for a while. So we'll, but uh, I think things are, things are looking good. We're hoping, I think, to know this week um, how, what the outcome of this is going to be. So. 
I want to, I know it it may or may not feel different to you. I talked to several folks who were here for the very first time last service, so they don't know what different feels like. Um, But this is going to be a little bit different. This uh, This is going to be a very personal message. Um, from my heart, and I, uh, I'm praying that I have the emotional stamina to do this again. I want to start with uh, some comments out of John chapter 15. When I was a brand new Christian, a few months old, um, this was 1976, five, six, somewhere in there. Um, and in my hometown, we only had one Christian bookstore, and it, wasn't, it was not well equipped. It had some records in it. Those are big round things, those of you who are... <laughs> like, they're like CDs, except they're really big. We don't even know what CDs are now. So anyway, it's, but I was buying Christian albums there, and, and I... I wanted, I needed a book, I needed a Christian book. I didn't know anything about who I should read or not read or, but I really believe the Lord led my hand to this book. It was a book, had a picture of a vineyard on the front of it. The title of the book was The True Vine. It was a little paperback book. My son told me, Dad, you need to write short books. So I'm trying to work on that. But this was a 75-page book written by a man that I did not know, had not heard of before. His name was Andrew Murray. He very quickly became my favorite author. Um, he was South African, pastor, and um, just every page I bought a little book because I thought I could take it to work and slip it in my drawer and open it up every now and then and look at it, which is what I did. Every page. Just like caught on fire when I started reading. I thought, this never heard anything like this before. And I read the book, I don't know how many times, wore the cover off of it, carried it with me everywhere I went. And I read it again this week. Just to remind me, it's been a while since I've looked at it. But it's about Jesus' teaching on John chapter 15, where he said, I'm the true vine. I am the true vine. And my Father is the vine dresser. I am the true vine and my father owns the vineyard. How about that? Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. This is kind of a family talk, so let me start out with 
a hard part of the conversation. I want to read a letter. Some of you have already received it. You already have read it, already know the contents. But let me read for those of you who have not. Sensing that a change in leadership was needed in our high school and college ministries, the executive leadership team, along with the personnel committee, have asked for and received the resignation of Pastor Dan Elkins as the high school and college pastor, effective January 31, 2023. Dan has been, please hear this. Dan has been a faithful pastor and servant of our church family since July 2020. Even though there were things that didn't come together during these last couple of years, we want to be clear that Dan has exhibited high moral character as well as love for our church, community, students, and Savior. We know that many of you love Dan, Mary Ann, and their children, and we will do what we can do to make sure their family is shown love and care while they pray for direction for their next ministry assignment. This was a very painful decision for all of us. But we trust that God has a plan for Dan and his family. And until that is revealed, they will continue to be members here at Fruit Cove as the Lord shows them what's next. I know this is hard to hear. For some of you, this is news. You hadn't heard it. I know it's hard to hear because my kids, my own children, have been through similar experiences. So I know how it feels from that side. Believe me, I, I've learned some things about myself in 30 years. I know what I like to do and I know what I don't like to do. I love being a pastor. I don't love this. I don't love having to do these kinds of announcements, these kinds of things. We are a family, dysfunctional, but still a family. And when one of us hurt, we all hurt. Jesus reminds us in John 15 that we are branches of the vine. We are branches of the vine. I'm the true vine. I'm the vine. You are the branches. And listen, if you aren't in the vine, you can't bear fruit. And therefore, you become useless and fruitless and lifeless. And let me say furthermore, because I know how we are in our thinking. Jesus nowhere in this passage of Scripture says you need to try harder to bear more fruit. You cannot try to bear fruit. The only command that you have in this passage is abide in Christ. If you are connected, if you are abiding in Christ, you will bear fruit. So the command for us is abide. The byproduct of that is you'll bear fruit. That's, that's what he's teaching, essentially. He said, I'm the vine, and my father's the vine dresser. There's this picture of Jesus as the vine that permeates this chapter. Now, I, I want to talk for a moment about the produce, the produce of the vine, the fruit of the vine. There's actually a, a fruit-bearing progression in these verses. And I'm sorry, I can't keep this thing straightened up today. There's actually a fruit-bearing progression in these verses. You'll notice in verse 2, he says, you know, there are branches that bear no fruit. And then further, he goes on to say there are branches that bear fruit. And then there are branches that bear more fruit. And then in verse 5, he says, there are branches that bear much fruit. So you go from no fruit to fruit to more fruit to much fruit. What am I supposed to do? Well, here's what you can pray. Lord, 
I'm not seeing any fruit in my life right now. Would you help me to bear fruit? Okay, great. Or I see fruit in my life right now. Would you help me to bear more fruit? Or I see more fruit in my life right now than I've ever seen. Maybe you can look back over the past five years. I see more fruit than I've ever seen before. Well, then you pray that I bear much fruit. So we go from no fruit, fruit, more fruit, much fruit. That's the rhythm that we're to be going through. That's the goal of the vine dresser, to get you from either, if you're a fruitless vine, how do we begin to bear fruit in a fruitless branch? If you're bearing some fruit, that's great. You can do a little bit more. But again, hear me, the, the fruit bearing part is not on you. You can't will fruit out of yourself. You can't work fruit out of yourself. But you can stay connected to the vine. And if you're connected, the fruit will be there as the proof. The end goal for the vine dresser is the fruit, not, not the root. This, this passage is about fruit, not root. The end goal for the vine dresser is good fruit, lots of it. He wants lots of good fruit. Otherwise, you have this ugly, spindly plant with no leaves and no purpose for existence except just being a branch that needs to be burned. That The fruit in these verses is sometimes interpreted as evangelism. Now, some of you will disagree with me, but that's okay. But my study has convinced me that what Jesus is talking about here is not evangelistic results. Now, this is a great evangelism sermon. Go out, bear fruit. You need to bear more fruit, much fruit. I, I, I witnessed to three people to go witness to six. You know, I've led four people to Christ. Okay, lead six. That's not what is being said here. Fruit is not how many people did I bring to church or lead to church. That's, there's nothing wrong with doing that. Please hear me. I'm not saying don't do that. I am saying don't confuse that with the fruit that Jesus is talking about here. This fruit is different. In fact, if I may, I, let me point you to Galatians chapter 5 for just a moment. In Galatians chapter 5, we kind of see the definition of the fruit that Jesus is talking about. He, he talks, first of all, about the, the, the fruitlessness of the works of the flesh. He said, now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit, one word, Fruits, not fruits of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is first, love. Have you ever, have you ever had a day when you have uh, just woke up in the morning and said, okay, you know, you came to church, you got all worked up and inspired or you read a Bible study or did something and you go, okay, today I'm gonna love people if it kills me. <laughs> have you had one of those days, you know? I, I'm gonna love, I'm gonna love everybody. I'm going to love. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go out and I'm going to love and then what happens? Then you get on the interstate. <laughs> and before you've gotten far, that promise is gone. You can't work that kind of thing up. The fruit of the Spirit, one of the things that gets produced as you abide in Christ is you're going to feel love. That love is going to be there. That's, a, that's an evidence. Joy. Joy doesn't mean everything's going great and you got some silly grin on your face. Joy means even in the midst of suffering, I'm feeling joyful. Doesn't mean happy. Joy. Peace. Goodness. Kindness. Patience. Faithfulness. Self-control. When you see a person that has that kind of fruit in their life, let me tell you something. You're going to want to be around that person. First of all, oh, there's something so wonderful and fragrant about fruit. Just, oh, wow, doesn't that smell good? You're going to have fruit. Now, if you look in your life and you go, yeah, I'm not seeing any of that, then 
We have a connection problem. We have a connection problem. The Old Testament, the prophets compared the nation of Israel to a vine. You know, the temple of Jerusalem, the old, te- the old temple in Jerusalem had a, an entryway with this large golden, pure gold vine. It was, it was a great vine. This pure gold vine that surrounded the entryway. There were, there were clusters of grapes on that vine that were as large as a grown man. It was gold. And if you want to give a special offering, you'd bring your jewelry or you'd bring a coin or a gold nugget and you'd melt it down and they would craft a leaf or a grape to add to that vine. And it just kept growing bigger and bigger and bigger. Gold. Gold vine. Amazing. Israel was a vine. Now, it was a sick vine. And this was what the prophets were concerned about. Isaiah was focused on Isaiah as this wild vine, producing wild fruit. Jeremiah was concerned about the, the vine being a strange vine. I don't even know what this is. Hosea was concerned about the vine being a barren vine, fruitless. Nothing on it. And it's a picture of how Israel had taken themselves further and further and further away from God and his covenant. They disconnected themselves from God. And the prophets were calling them back to connect again. But Jesus said, I'm the true vine. I'm not a wild vine. I'm not a strange vine. I'm not a barren vine. I'm I'm the true vine. I'm the fulfillment of all of that. I'm the true vine. But let me finish talking uh, just by dealing with one word that comes up a couple of times in the passage, and that's pruning. The pruning of the vine. Talked about the portrait, I think, the produce, and now the pruning. And I just want to focus your attention on that one word, that one idea. Now, I, please, let me confess. I know less about vines and vineyards and growing fruit than anybody in this room. Everybody in this room knows more about it than I do. If you know nothing about it, you know more about it than I do. How about that? That's, that's how bad I am, okay? I know nothing about how to grow fruit. But I do know a healthy vine when I see one. Pam left our backyard covered with jasmine vines. Now, if you've grown jasmine before, they grow, any of y'all from Kentucky, I don't know, Rick, y'all here from Kentucky, they grow like kudzu in Kentucky. You don't have to work on kudzu. It just takes over. Well, I learned at jasmine vines. My Pam loved jasmine vines. Oh, she loved jasmine. And these things have taken over my neighbor's fences, hedges of jasmine vines. They grow up trees, really high up into trees. Well, I'm telling you, when they bloom, you come to my house, you will smell jasmine. I mean, it'll be in your clothes. It'll be everything. I mean, it's, the fragrance is overwhelming, but we got vines everywhere. I, I know how to grow jasmine vines. Just leave them alone, let them grow. <laughs> but you have to take care of a grapevine. You have to tend it. You, you have to cultivate it. You have to, you have to, you have to deal with weeds and you know, I, I, I grew up in a, with a large field right across the street from our house. A guy that owned it planted two or three rows of, of vines, grape vines. And we would sneak over in the summer, hide in the shade, and eat ourselves sick on grapes. I mean, it was beautiful, fragrant. It was gorgeous. And then after, but after harvest, he would attack the vines. I mean, literally. He would come in with a big knife. And he would, he would attack. He would just start lopping off branches, big branches and little branches and dead branches. And some of them, here's what I never got. Some of them that still had big clusters of leaves on them, or of grapes on them. He cut those off too. Well, that didn't make sense. Why do you cut off a branch that's got fruit on it? What did Jesus say? He prunes 
every branch that bears fruit. And this guy knew what he was doing because every year he would cut those things back where they just looked like bloody stumps sticking out of the ground. They were ugly until the next season. And then they were fruit. It was incredible. Never, I never got it, but he was pruning. He pruned so he would have a good harvest the next season. But, you know, fruit trees and fruit vines have to be pruned or else the growth they produce will overload the root system and overload the tree. Would you like to see, by the way, would you like to see the ugliest orange tree in Florida? I mean, I know that's not why you came today, but can I just give you a bonus? Would you like to see the ugliest fruit? I should charge you admission to get to see this. But let me show you the ugliest. Can we see the ugliest fruit tree in Florida? There it is. That is the ugliest orange tree in Florida right there. That's, and, and I know that it is because it's in my backyard. That's me growing fruit right there. Okay, that's how I do it. And, and so... You know what the problem was? I fertilized it. I watered it. You know what I never did? Never pruned it. Never pruned it. And that's what happens when you don't prune it. All right? We together? You know you're not hearing from a horticultural expert here. I'm not a viticulturalist. I don't know how to grow vines. But... But I will tell you this. I do know a church is like a vine. A church is like a plant. It's like a tree. So let's talk about this phrase. Every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes. Let's talk about pruning. You know, when you have the perspective of 30 years, I don't want to throw my weight around, but you see stuff. You have the ability to see perspective of, oh, this is a 10-year cycle. Oh, this is a 10-year cycle. Oh, this is a 10-year cycle. We've had incredible seasons of growth here at Fruit Cove. They have been explosive, literally at times, unexplainable. I don't even know why they came. Because I'm not an evangelist. I'm not a boy, you know, just really draw people in. I'm just not that guy. So when people showed up, it always surprised me. Um, and still does, to tell you the truth. And sometimes I know that, that churches grow, you know, because the church, another church is having a problem. But a lot of our growth, I would say most of it, has been folks moving into the area, new folks coming into the area. And we do some outreach stuff well here, but mostly I can't explain why it happens. Our church in 1995... Started growing. We went from one, we were meeting in the building A, small sanctuary, still there. We were meeting in there, had one service. And then all of a sudden, people started coming. And we had to go to two services. Then we had to go to three services. If you've been over there, we had chairs in the foyer that people couldn't, couldn't get in the room. And we thought, in our brilliance, hey, we need to build a sanctuary. Guess what we did? Built too small. We built what we could afford. But the first service we had, we filled it up. And pretty soon we were in two services in this sanctuary. And that's a wonderful thing. It's, it's an incredible thing. Uh, you know, we had church growth magazines contact. How are you doing this? What's going on? How is this happening? I don't know. Man. I, you know, I, I didn't have a plan. I'm just going, okay, so here comes this. And, you know, this, this was going on. So then the growth stopped for a while. Don't know why it stopped. So it's like a plant, like a tree, like your grass. Living things need dormant seasons. They just stop. And those are ugly seasons. But then they come back. Some of your yards right now. Ugly. I've seen them. They're ugly yards. You should be ashamed. They're terrible looking yards. <laughs> but your grass is dormant. And it needs to be dormant for a while. It's okay. But then just like clockwork, something else started happening. My first pruning season. 
2003, 10 years after I'd been here, just come in 93, 10 years later, first pruning season. We started losing people, don't know why. Don't know why they came, don't know why they're leaving. Start losing people. We started losing staff. Major staff turnover. And my dad got brain cancer, died in June. Then I was diagnosed with cancer in August. And I realized then that God was pruning me and the church at the same time. And then you know what happened? Growing season came. And then it just got fun again and everything's wonderful and I learned that I like growing season a whole lot better than pruning season. And we got through this 10 years, built a rock, 10 years. And almost like clockwork, we hit a second pruning season 10 years later. There was growth, dormant, growth, dormant, pruning. We had a major staff turnover. Heartbreaking. Seeing nobody for one particular reason or another. It's just they, people, they, the staff was just being moved. God was moving them in different directions, different places, different ministries. Church members that we loved were leaving. Some were dying. You, you know, we've studied it. You can't stop that. That's going to happen. And the church started changing. We lost precious people, beloved people, fruitful people, fruitful staff members. That God just said, I'm going to put you here. That was 20, 20, uh, 20, uh, 2012, 2013. Guess what it is now? Ten years later. Guess what's happening now? We're in it. Um, we'll lose members. We are. We we've lost some. We'll lose. We'll lose members. We've done studies. People get mad. They leave churches. And right now, you know who's worse? Let me, let me stick a finger in your face. You know who's worse? Baby boomers. Y'all need to settle down. We're, you know, <laughs> baby boomers are the worst. They're the ones wondering, oh, I need to find a church that I can get fed. I want to go to a church where they sing with the hymnal and the lights on. I want, you know, I need a church that does this. You know what, you know what my kids call those? First world problems. You know where they don't have those conversations? On the mission field. What? You have a church? What? Not us. So there's that going on. And pruning happens to the membership. It's, some of that's going to involve us losing staff members for a variety of reasons. Retirement for some. God calling them to a different ministry. Sometimes people die. Fruitful church members. Beloved staff members. They leave. And here's the biggie. Pruning is always happening in a change of pastoral leadership. Some of y'all ain't gonna like the new guy. If we could resurrect Billy Graham, <laughs> you're not gonna like the new guy. Personalities don't mix. He may have other plans for ministries and you don't like that. But here's what I do know. In this season, 
The last branch to be pruned is me. All right? This church is going to look different. It's going to be different. And I believe, I don't pretend to know the mind of God on this matter, and I don't know how long I'm going to be here. I was very carefully cautioned to not say that in this service. I don't know if I'll be here in a year, maybe, maybe not. But I'll promise you, it's going to start looking different. Some of you are going to go, I don't like that. Well, you know, I understand. But here's what I do know. Here's, here's what I think. Let me just throw my, my idea in the ring. I think these seasons are necessary because our tendency is to look too much to people. And so sometimes God has to say, I'm going to take the pastor out. I'm going to take this staff person out. I'm going to take this connect group leader out. Why? They do something wrong? I need you to look to me, not to people. We look to Jesus, not to people. And this is hard. This is, this is a hard thing to adjust ourselves to. And I don't know how many of you will make the turn. I don't know how many of you will say, well, I'll hang in there and see whatever God does here because God has been working here faithfully. I don't see anything that indicates to me that he's going to stop working. He's just going to do it through different people. So you have to figure that out. And maybe it's some of you guys sitting on the sideline right now and you're getting ready to get pulled onto the field. It'll look different. But Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, right? Amen. The vine doesn't change. Branches look different. Vine's pretty much where it is. We need to look to the Lord, not to people. People let you down. I, listen, they'll all let you down. Everybody, everybody will let you down. I'll let you down. Probably already have some of you. I haven't yet, still got a little bit of time, so give me time. You can't look to people. Your confidence is in the Lord, and that's where it has to stay. And your eyes have to stay on him. Let me ask you, see if you, you know, you're supposed to find yourself. You're supposed to take this parable and go, oh, that's me. So, so can, can I ask you three or four questions? I'll be done. I know I'm over time. I'm going to shut up, I promise. I just actually just got started on something. I want another hour, but I'll stop here. Four questions. Number one, are you abiding in the vine? That's the only command. Are you abiding in the vine? Or are you trying to make it on your own? Have you convinced yourself there's no other church, yet. you know, everybody's got, everybody's got something wrong. Everybody's theology is messed up, Bible's messed up, worship's messed up, people messed up. Listen, let me, let me just make you promise. You're out here wandering around right now looking for a church. I need to find a church home. I need to find a church family. I need to find, yes, you do. Because a vine, a branch that's disconnected from the vine is fruitless and you're just going to dry up and blow away. You need to be connected. And here's what you're doing. You're, you're traveling around from broken, imperfect church to broken, imperfect church to broken, imperfect, messed up church to broken, imperfect, messed up church. You might as well join this one. We're broken, <laughs> we're imperfect, we're messed up, and everyone you go to is gonna be the same. Stop using that as your excuse for not getting in the vine. Well, I need to find the right one. This is the right one. We're all broken. 
We're all broken, all right? So welcome to the club. Just come on in. We'll scoot you aside and make room for you in the vine. You're, you're welcome to come here. But you can't do this by yourself. You're not supposed to do this by yourself. Get in the vine. Abide in the vine. Secondly, are you in a season of being pruned in your life? Maybe you got just got downsized on a job or you had to move or you got an illness or you lost a mate or you're just wondering, what is God doing? What is God doing? I know I'm being fruitful. I'm being faithful. I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. The fruit is, is, is present. Why is, my, why is my life falling apart? Why is God taking this away from me? Why is this happening? Why is that happening? We, we do that. Listen. Remember this, pruning is not punishment. Sometimes pruning is discipline, but it's not punishment. But it's always painful. It's always painful. But it's pain that leads to fruit. And the purpose of the pruning is to lead you to produce more fruit, much fruit, so that the vine is glorified. Not you, the branch, so that the vine is glorified. And that leads to a third question. Are you being fruitful? Are you seeing fruit in your life? Are you in that place of going, there's no fruit? Okay, then how do we help you get where, where you can get connected in your abiding so you can produce fruit? Maybe you go, so I'm, I have some fruit. Okay, how about more fruit? How about much fruit? You, you have to self-evaluate that. I'm not judging you. Don't judge the person around you. You, don't, you, know, you, you look at your own fruit. You look at your own fruit. Is there any in your life? And that leads me to the last question. Are you in the vine or are you just in the church? Are you in the vine? Connecting your body to that seat you're sitting in today is not how you abide in Christ. And it doesn't mean that you're abiding in Christ just because you're abiding in a pew. Are you in the vine? Or are you just in the church? Now, those are questions I want you to think about. I'm asking them from a pastor's heart. And I don't always hit this kind of place, but, you know, my, my pastor's heart is broken today. And Tim Maynard's heart is broken today. It's hard. It's hard to have these kind of conversations. But I sure want to leave a fruitful church as my legacy. If I have a legacy, I want it to be that. It's a fruitful church that looks like Jesus. It looks like Jesus. So if you're out looking around for your imperfect church, hey, we'll offer ourselves up right now. You come on and uh, we'll let you come in here without a problem. We'll work out whatever details we need to work out to get you here. Uh, well, if you want to come in, it's some of you I had a lady that came in the first service. 
She said, I cannot tell you how many years it's been since I've been in a church. But I came here today and I felt like, she said, I called my husband and I said, am I alive right now? He said, yeah. She said, well, I'm wondering because I feel like I'm in heaven. And listen, this is how it can be. Out of darkness into light. Amen. You can come. Father, have your way in us. We, we close. Uh, Lord, you know I love this church. You, you know it. I wish I could say it to each of them individually the way I really want to. How much they mean to me and have meant to me. And still going forward mean to me. Or we want to be a, a branch in, in the vine. We want to be just a part of the vineyard that you are building on this, on this earth. And we want to be connected to the vine. Even when that means times of dormancy, times of pruning, come. And help us. in this important season in our church history, Lord, as we move forward and open ourselves up for new leadership and knowing that that's going to mean changes will come. Guide us in this moment together. And Lord, be greatly glorified as we bear fruit that will point people to the true vine who is Jesus Christ. But we ask this in his name. Amen. Let's stand, church family.